Mr. Pichai, let me ask about Google. If you were forced to split up your business lines, say spin off ad tech and YouTube, can you describe what happens to consumers there? Uh, Congressman, today, uh, consumers in most of the areas we are, are dealing with, they see uh, prices free or falling and they get more choice than ever before. So I think, I think it serves them well. And you're right there. Is that Google and Facebook now capture the vast majority of digital ad revenue. Although news publishers produce valuable content, it is Google and Facebook that increasingly profit off their content. Publishers have told us that Google and Facebook maintain their dominance in these markets in part through anti-competitive con conduct, as well as uh, conflict of interest. Mr. Pichai, I understand that Google collects user data on users' uh, browsing activity through its Chrome browser. Does Google use that data for its own purposes, either in advertising or to develop and refine its algorithms? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we do use data to improve our products and services for our users. Anytime we do it, we believe in giving users choice, control, and transparency. We make and, it very clear, and we give them simplified settings to choose how they like their data. And, and so you, use, you do use the data that you get from, from uh, uh, these companies for your purposes? My, my understanding was whether we use data in general to improve our products and services. And, you know, we do use data to show ads, but we give users the choice. They can turn ads personalization on or off. Now, and this, this, this obviously, the use of this data from all these, from all, from all these companies gives you a tremendous advantage over them and over any competitor. Earlier this year, Google announced plans to retire third-party cookies that websites attach to users' browsers. And this allows users to, track, to be tracked across the internet. A consequence of that change is that it will put other digital advertising market participants at a disadvantage because they can no longer track users. And at the, at the very, very danger of being pro-cookie, because I'm not when I use my computer as well. But, and I understand that there are le legitimate privacy concerns with third-party cookies, but I do want to focus on the competition aspect. Did this as asset action also place Google at a disadvantage, or does Google have alternative means of collecting that user data to inform its digital um, advertising activities, Mr. Pichai? Congressman, as you rightly pointed out, uh, this is an area where uh, we are focused on user privacy, and users clearly don't want to be tracked with third-party cookies. Uh, in fact, other browser vendors, uh, including from Apple and Mozilla Foundation, have also implemented these changes. Uh, we are doing it thoughtfully, giving time for the industry to adapt because we know publishers uh, depend on revenue in this area. But it's an important change, and I think we have to be focused on privacy uh, to drive the change forward. But you have other ways of collecting that information, correct? Well, on our first party services, uh, you know, we don't rely on cookies and obviously when people come and type into search. I'm not asking you if you rely on cookies. I'm asking you if you have other ways of collecting it through Gmail or consumer facing platforms, right? Uh, we don't use data from Gmail for ads, uh, uh, Congressman, but uh, to the extent on the services where we provide ads and, you know, if users have consented to ads personalization, yes, we do have data. Mr. Pichai, in 2015, Google announced that it would not allow third parties to buy YouTube ads via AdX. That means that ad buys on YouTube are conducted only through Google demand side products. Google justified this change by citing privacy and user experience. My understanding is that Google cited a concern that third party digital ad participants would develop user profiles based on this viewing. It is also my understanding that even under the GDPR, you are allowed you allow users to provide consent which would authorize this type of activity it seems that if the, that this policy regardless of the privacy concerns reduced competition for dem demand side platforms on youtube do you agree but after google stopped allowing third parties to buy youtube ads via adx google limited the interoperability of third party analytics on youtube you now require the use of ads on data hub Again, the justification is based on user privacy. Other ad market participants may not have access to that data, but it doesn't, do, doesn't disappear, does it? Congressman, this is consistent with how today many services, be it Facebook or Snapchat or Pinterest, 
you work with their ad tools to buy ads on their properties. Well, I, I understand that, but the excuse is privacy, but the data doesn't disappear. You just have greater control over it, right? Well, so you would, regardless of the intent was to lessen competition or not, the action resulted in smaller competitors unable to participate in placing ads on YouTube. Isn't that correct? Congressman, we see robust choice for, uh, you know, uh, uh, advertisers. You know, there is several alternatives. There is, you know, obviously Facebook suite of products. There is Amazon with their ads marketplace. Uh, there is companies like Snapchat, Pinterest, Twitter, there are new competitors who have emerged, and this is why we have seen advertising costs decline by 40% in the last 10 years. And so we see dynam dynamism in the marketplace. Here's we are focused on it. When we're using privacy, we're trying to use privacy and we're using privacy as a shield, but what we're really doing and what your company is really doing is using it as a cudgel to beat down the competition. And when we're talking about privacy, it, it's a great word that people care about, but not when it's utilized to, do, to control more of the marketplace and squeeze out smaller competitors. Google makes most of its revenue through selling advertising, and Google's advertising exchange is a, quote, real-time marketplace to buy and sell display advertising space, correct? Oh, yes, Congressman, that's correct. And over 2 million websites, including online newspapers, use that exchange, correct? We are very proud to support publishers, and uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but yes, that okay. seems to well, that's, be that's an estimate put forth by tech expert Dina Srinivasan, um, and your own website for Google Display Network says you have access to over 2 million sites. What is Google's share of the ad exchange market? Congressman, uh, I'm not exactly familiar. I've seen various, uh, various reports, but uh, okay. you know, we, Let we are a popular choice. Great, let me put it up for you. If you look at the screen, you will see that um, 50 to 60%, Google has 50 to 60% according to the online platforms and digital advertising CMA market study that was just released. Um, and in order to buy and sell on these exchanges, websites and advertisers go through a middleman like Google's DV360 and Google Ads. Uh, if you look at the slide, Mr. Pichai, you can see that the share of this buy side market that Google has is 50 to 90%, according to the same study. Um, and I just want to simplify how these exchanges work. So say in Seattle, Dee's Electronics, a mom and pop business, wants to buy online ad space in the Seattle Times. Dee's Electronics would need to go to a middleman like Google Ads, which would then bid for ad space on an ad exchange. The problem is that Google controls all of these entities. So it's running the marketplace, it's acting on the buy side, and it's acting on the sell side at the same time, which is a major conflict of interest. It allows you to set rates very low as a buyer of ad space from newspapers, depriving them of their ad revenue, and then also to sell high to small businesses who are very dependent on advertising on your platform. It sounds a bit like a stock market. Except, unlike a stock market, there's no regulation on your ad exchange market. If there were regulation, it would actually prohibit insider trading, which means that the broker can't use the data in the broker division to buy and sell for their own interests. Instead, brokers have to serve the clients, their clients. Does Google have a similar obligation to serve its clients, the businesses that are selling and buying ad space? Congressman, if I could explain this for a minute, uh, we paid over $14 billion to publishers. We are deeply committed to journalism in this area. On an, on an average, we pay out 69% of the revenue when publishers use Google's buy and I, I, uh, sell side tools. And you know, out of it, it's a low margin business for us. We do it because we want to help support right. publishers in no, this area. I, I understand that, Mr. Pichai. What I'm trying to get at is when any company controls the buy and the sell side, I worked on Wall Street a very long time ago, there are reasons that insider trading is regulated, and this ad exchange is essentially the same thing, and without accountability, it isn't meaningful to just care about the newspapers. We're seeing them die all over, and ad revenue is a big reason. Let me put up a graph here that shows that Google's ad revenue is increasingly coming from ads on Google-owned sites and less so from other websites. Can you explain that trend? Um, 
I can't quite see whether this is net revenue or gross revenue. Obviously, when it comes to non-Google properties, we share the majority of revenue back to publishers. Whereas on our own properties, we obviously, you know, we are, we have the inventory. So, but I would need to understand more. I just quickly looked at it. I, okay. I'm not sure I fully we, we can grasp, send it. But. We can send it to you and make sure you have it. Um, you know, Google has not made its search traffic volumes public in years, so there's no way for us to know uh, exactly what's happening here. And there's no way for businesses to verify whether they've been treated fairly or left behind in favor of Google-owned companies. Is Google steering advertising revenue to Google Search? Uh, Congresswoman, users come to Google Search. Uh, it is that traffic, and you know that's where uh, our source of revenue comes from. So we are focused on providing users the information they are looking for. We work hard to earn their trust. We know competition for information is just a click thank, away. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Pichai. Uh, Mr. Pichai, in 2007, Google purchased DoubleClick, the leading provider of certain advertising tools. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, Congresswoman. When Congress, per when Google purchased or uh, proposed the merger, alarm bells were raised about the access to data Google would have, specifically the ability to connect a user's personal identity with their browsing activity. Google, however, committed to Congress and to the antitrust enforcers that the deal would not reduce user privacy. Google chief legal advisor testified before the Senate Antitrust Subcommittee that Google wouldn't be able to merge this data even if it wanted to, given contractual restrictions. But in June of 2016, Google went ahead and merged this data anyway, effectively destroying anonymity on the internet. Did you sign off on this decision to combine the sets of data with Google, that Google had told Congress would be uh, kept separate? Okay, okay, you signed off on the decision. Practically, this decision meant that your company would not combine all of, would, would now combine, for example, all of my data on Google, my search history, my location from Google Maps, information from my emails from Gmail, as well as my personal identity with the record of almost all of the websites I visiting. According to an email from a DoubleClick executive, that was exactly the type of reduction in user privacy that Google's founders had previously worried would lead to a backlash. And I quote, they were unwavering on the policy due to philosophical reasons, which is Larry and Sergey's fundamentally not wanting users associated with a cross-site cookie. They were also worried about a privacy storm as well as damage to Google's brand. Now, Mr. Pakai, isn't it true that what changed between 2007 and 2016 is that Google gained enormous market power? So while Google had to care about user privacy in 2007, it no longer had to in 2016. Would you agree that what changed was Google gained enormous market power? Congresswoman, this is an important issue. If I could explain. Well, you know, we today make it very easy for users to be in control of their data. We have simplified their settings. They can turn ads personalization on or off. We have combined most of activity settings into three groupings. Uh, we remind users to go to a privacy checkup. One billion users have okay, done Mr. so. Okay, Mr. Rakai, thank you so much for that. I am concerned that Google's bait and switch with DoubleClick is part of a broader pattern where Google buys up companies for the purposes of surveilling Americans, and because of Google, Google's dominance, users have no choice but to surrender. In 2019, Google made over 80% of its total revenue through selling a ad placement. Is that correct, Mr. Pakai? Uh, you know, About majority 80%? of the business. Yeah, okay. Uh, and because Google uh, sells behavioral ads, ads targeted to each of us as individuals, the more user data that Google collects, the more money Google can make. More user data means more money. Is that correct? Uh, in, in general, that's not true. Uh, for example, when more you come user inside, data, when you type, not the more most money the Google connect, collects. So you're saying that so, the more user data it does not mean the more money that Google can collect. Congresswoman, most of the data today we collect is to help users. 
uh, and provide personalized experiences back. Ad okay. data is, thank you. Thank is you so much, Mr. Pichai. Mr. Pichai, Google has restricted advertising analytics or the portability of user data related to advertising due to compliance with the general data protection regulation. Specifically, in 2018, Google restricted the ability to export the double ID, a cookie-based identifier that complies individual user data and creates profiles through Google data transfer. Is that correct? Uh, Congressman, not familiar with the specifics of that particular issue, but happy to uh, follow up more once I understand it better. So you're not particularly familiar with how you're complying with GDPR? Uh, Congressman, we, we've long been working to comply with GDPR. We think it's an important regulation and, you know, we have, uh, we, we are in full compliance uh, to the extent of my knowledge. Uh, I just meant I'm not aware of that specific issue with the identifier you mentioned there, but happy to understand it better and follow up. All right. So in order to comply with GDPR, Google must retain control over more user data and restrict the ability to combine this user data with other platforms to conduct cross-platform analysis. It seems as if that ultimately limits the ability of advertisers to make comparisons between Google-based campaigns and non-Google-based campaigns. Would you agree with that? Uh, in all these ecosystems, we are, we are balancing between users, advertisers, and publishers. We deeply care about the privacy and security of our users. And so when we serve these ecosystems, we have to take that into account. Uh, we have to comply with important laws and regulations in every country uh, we operate in. And so that, that's the delicate balance we are constantly striking. But we are focused on uh, our users and trying to do the best we can. And I, I just want to be perfectly clear. Uh, I I've personally believe that, that just the market power consolidation is significant. But I also want to be clear that when we're moving forward to regulate this, that we aren't actually squeezing out competition in our quest in our, in our quest to do something, because I've, I've said that before in this hearing, and I'll say it again. Usually in our quest to, to regulate big companies, we end up hurting small companies more. And I'm a strong privacy advocate, but the consequences of GDPR have been to further entrench large established actors like Google, leading to regulatory capture that exasperates competition concerns. And Google's digital ad market share has increased since the impl imp implementation of GDPR. Do you know that to be correct? Uh Congressman, uh, to just give you a sense of the robust competition we see, ad prices have fallen down by 40% in the past 10 years. And in fact, in the US, advertising as a share of GDP has come down from 1.4% in 1992, less than 1% today. So we see robust competition in the marketplace. And as I said earlier, you know, we have to comply with regulation. We have to interpret it strictly and we have to balance the ecosystem, but our utmost care is ensuring privacy and security of our users. But increasingly, Google just shows whatever is most profitable for Google, be it Google Ads or Google's own sites. And so my question, Mr. Pichai, isn't there a fundamental conflict of interest between serving users who want to access the best and most relevant information and Google's business model, which incentivizes Google to sell ads and keep users on Google's own sites? We've always focused on providing users the most relevant information, and we rely on the trust for users to, to come back to Google every day. In fact, a vast majority of uh, queries in Google, we don't show ads at all, and we show ads only for a small subset of queries where the intent from users is highly commercial. For example, they may be looking for something like TV sets or so on. But Mr. Bichai, so, what, is the, what is the value of the part that you do use the Google Ads for? I mean, it's a substantial part of your business. What's the, what's the actual uh, value? 200 billion, 300 billion? Uh, uh, you know, in terms of revenue, uh, it's around 100, 100 plus billion dollars. Okay. But, uh, that's a know, lot of money, Mr. Bichai. And to me, that's evidence that Google is increasingly a walled garden, which keeps users on Google sites, even if Google doesn't have the most relevant information and it's economically catastrophic for other companies online. Uh, Google is now by far the top online site where Americans watch videos, including children's videos. And as I'm sure you're aware, federal law prevents companies from collecting data on children under 13. However, just last year, the Federal Trade Commission found that Google had spent years knowingly collecting data on children under 13 on YouTube and offering advertisers the ability to target those children directly. 
Uh, Mr. Pache, did YouTube use the data it illegally acquired to improve its ability to target ads to children? We are, uh, you know, we are, this is an area, uh, you know, I take it very seriously. I'm a parent too. We are committed. We have invested tremendously. We have a dedicated product for kids in YouTube kids on the main YouTube platform. We make sure we have clear policies. We enforce them rigorously. Just in Q4 of 2019, we flagged and removed uh, almost close to a million videos, uh, potentially for concerns around child safety. So it's an area we are investing uh, uh, rigorously and, and will okay. continue to do so. Well, I'm more concerned about the fact that you're investing rigorously in luring in advertisers like toy makers, Mattel and Hasbro by telling them that YouTube is the number one website regularly visited by kids. So that sounds like you're targeting the kids and then targeting advertisers to, to bring them on board. Um, it, is that correct? Today, in the main site of YouTube, uh, we don't allow anyone under 13 to create accounts. There are scenarios in which there could be family viewing, and, and today there are creators who create content uh, oriented towards families, and, and as part of that, there are advertisers which are interested in connecting with those users. But okay. everything we do here, uh, we obviously comply with uh, all the uh, all the applicable regulations. And, okay, well, and let's look at some of, the, some of the content that is specifically for children. Um, COPPA um, makes it um, illegal to um, target those kids, but, but we've got an issue where content creators are in a very difficult position now. So if a show like Sesame Street doesn't want to show ads for junk food on YouTube, does YouTube allow it to make that choice? Uh, today, we, we do, you know, we, we have uh, choices both for creators uh, in terms of, uh, you know, tools and preferences, and we have extensive uh, tools for advertisers. And above all, for users, we give a choice. They can e either use YouTube as a subscription service uh, without seeing those types of ads, or, uh, you know, they can use it for free with ads. So we give choice and, and you know, for us, it is of utmost importance that YouTube is a place where people come to learn and, you know, we find increasingly small and medium businesses use YouTube to thrive, especially even during COVID, uh, particularly okay. many, many Let's go businesses back to who... content that's designed for children. So, you know, if there's an organization like Sesame Street that wants to provide child-centered content, but they don't want that content to be sullied, shall we say, with junk food ads or something, my understanding is that you say that the content creators can do that, but we've got a recent report from the Wall Street Journal that says YouTube hasn't been honoring those requests, and it's been making it difficult for independent auditing companies like Open Slate to independently audit that and then report back to those content creators about whether or not YouTube is, is honoring those. Is that correct? I'm not familiar with the particular report, but I'm happy to uh, understand it better and you know have my office follow up with your staff, Congressman. Facebook is dominant, not just in the social media market, but also in its digital surveillance capabilities. In 2012, Facebook had several tools that allowed it to conduct digital surveillance, including trackers, Facebook's like button, Facebook login, and a series of application programming interfaces, or APIs. Mr. Zuckerberg, these tools provide Facebook with insights into its competitors' websites and apps. Isn't that correct? So uh, Congressman, I, I'm, I, I think broadly the answer to what you're saying is, is, uh, is yes. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, in 2004, there were dozens of social media companies. Facebook distinguished itself from the competitors, competitors by focusing specifically on privacy. You had a short, clear privacy policy. It was just 950 words. It made a promise to users, and I quote, we do not and will not use cookies to collect private information from any user. And you said, will not. That's a commitment about the future, and that was 2004. Mr. Zuckerberg, today, does Facebook use cookies to collect private information on users? Congresswoman, my understanding to that is is no. Uh, we're not using cookies to collect private information uh, about about people who use our services, and I, I believe we've upheld that commitment. 
Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Zuckerberg, do you think that your company would be as successful if it had started with today's cookies policy in place? Uh, Congresswoman, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but in general, cookies is not a, a, a big part of how we're um, collecting information. Uh, it, we primarily use them to make sure that uh, someone can stay logged in on web. Um, we use them to some degree for, for security to make sure that uh, you, you don't have uh, someone trying to log in under a lot of different accounts under uh, for one computer or something like that. So, Mr. Brook, Ms. Zuckerberg, once again, you do not use cookies. Congresswoman, just to make yes sure I'm no. clear, we do use cookies. Yes or no. We do use cookies. Okay. Yes, we do use cookies. Okay, so Mr. Zuckerberg, the bottom line here is that you broke a commitment to your users. And who can say if you may or may not do that again in the future? The reality is that Facebook's market power grew and Facebook sacrificed its users' policy. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you, gentlemen. I'd like to uh, redirect your attention to antitrust law rather than fringe conspiracy theories. Uh, Mr. Bezos, our investigation. Mr. Chairman, uh, we have the email. There is no fringe. It's not your time. Jordan, you do not have the time. Be, please but, be respectful but, but, of your colleague. Someone directly, she controls directly, the time. Directly, put your mask on. Mr. Put your mask on. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Raskin. Mr. Jordan. You, Jordan, you want to talk do, about masks. Mr. Jordan. Ms. Why Scanlon. Why would the Deputy Secretary the of Treasury unmask Mr. Michael Flynn's Mr. name, Mr. Scanlon. Mr. Raskin? And what I want to know Mr. is, Scanlon, when someone comes after my motives for asking questions, I get a chance to respond. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.